Hello again, this is Alison, welcoming you back to the final part of the year-round garden. I hope that once again you have spent some time out in your garden and have now identified gaps in different layers that can be used to add colour in different seasons that need it. Or possibly you have decided on a style and colour scheme for complete replanting. Well now, finally, it is time to choose plants. Definitely one of the best parts of gardening. And I hope that after watching the first two videos in this topic, you understand how important it is to decide exactly what job you want any particular plant to do. Because then the choice becomes so much easier and the result so much more successful. Part three, putting it all together. In part one, you saw this graphic and I said that you needed some way to filter out and reduce the choice of plants. Part two explained how planning the border so that plants complement and succeed each other instead of all fighting for attention creates an attractive and long lasting display. You still need to consider the suitability of the soil and situation for a plant, but clearly there's a lot more to selecting on appearance than simply whether each individual plant is one of your favourites. We need to consider the height and shape so that the plant fits into the border above, below or through its neighbours. The season or seasons that the plant is at its best and make sure that it fits into the overall style and colour scheme for the border. And finally, is the whole border in balance with enough evergreens to structure in the winter, but not so many that it is boring in summer. It may even be that not all the plants are your absolute favourite. I'm not suggesting that you include ones that you really don't like, but back to the orchestra analogy from part two. Not every plant has to be a star. The best effects often come from pleasing or surprising combinations. Draw your plan to provide colour and texture in all seasons throughout the layers and choose plants to match it. In this video, I'll show you plants of each type and each layer to give you some ideas to get started on your own border. All of these are happy in normal border soil that's neither waterlogged nor constantly dry and sun or light shade, and all are hardy in most of the UK. If you live in a location with a particularly challenging microclimate, then you should already be used to checking the cultivation needs of plants. Don't worry if my selections don't suit your style or the location of your garden. There are thousands of plants to choose from, and now you know how to make that choice. Let's start out with a reminder of the ways that plants offer colour, flowers, foliage, berries, seed heads, and stems and bark, and then map general groups and types of plants to each season to give you a framework, a starting point for your plant selections. As the question mark moves around the seasons, I'll ask you to think of a couple of plants that you love to see then, either by name or more general description. And then I'll offer my suggestions, starting with what is in the garden in spring. Spring is a season when the garden really seems to wake up. Lots of shrubs will be putting out new leaves, often in bronzy colours or much brighter before they mature down to green for the summer. Rhododendrons and azaleas in the same family start flowering any time from March onwards. And there are some spring flowering perennials. Hellebores are a good example with their nodding downward facing heads above the new leaves. And of course, spring flowering bulbs, starting with snowdrops going on right through to the very late spring tulips. There's plenty in the garden in spring. And so we turn our attention to summer. What are your favourite summer plants? Flowers come to the fore in summer. Every garden can be jam packed full of flower colour. Roses may be the archetypal summer flowering shrub, but there are plenty of other shrubs doing their stuff then too. And cottage garden perennials in flower from May right through to September if you make your choices carefully. And it's the season of bedding plants when the frosts are over and you can choose pots and containers to have different colour schemes and different styles of bedding over a year. And so we come on to autumn. What do you like to see in the garden in autumn? 
as summer drifts into early autumn, there will still be sunflowers on perennials and shrubs. But as autumn gets into full swing, it's the leaves that take over, the bright yellow, orange and red before they finally fall. And then we see the berries, a range of colours, everything from white through yellow, orange, red, even into purple. And finally, grasses. Although like the other perennials, these are really dying back on the top growth now, it stays quite strong and vertical, the seed heads all turning a straw colour until the winter storms may finally do damage. And so we come to winter. What do you see in your garden in winter? Or I suppose really, what would you like to see in your garden in winter? A few winter flowering shrubs such as Mahonia, Camellia and Witch Hazel, are worth their weight in gold in the winter. Welcome to insects seeking pollen and nectar, as well as gardeners seeking a little bit of colour. Beyond that is stems, bark and variegated leaves that we're using to cheer ourselves up and give a bright display. I have added in evergreen and deciduous shrubs explicitly on this slide, as they are so crucial to the garden all year round. A small number of carefully chosen specimens really do give interest in all seasons. And so on to some example plants. I have divided this part of the video into two sections. Firstly looking at some small trees and some shrubs that create the structure of the border, the skeleton that remains even in winter. This will help if you're planting up a border from scratch as the structural plants always go in first. After that, we'll look at the infill plants, ground cover, perennials, bulbs and climbers. This is a second stage to planting up and would also be useful for those of you who just have some gaps to fill. Of course, there are dozens of plants that you could use for each space and I'm not trying to produce a video plant encyclopedia. I have simply selected four or five examples for each layer with the mixture of plants that will probably be familiar because they are so very garden worthy, and a few that I hope will expand your knowledge and range. So let's start at the top with some trees that will not get out of hand. Whilst a mature oak or beech tree makes an impressive sight, in a small or medium sized garden, you are likely to want a tree that gives a bit of height without reaching 30 metres and casting dense shade in summer. Asa griseum, the paper bark maple, makes a well-shaped tree with a high canopy at its best with autumn leaves and rich peeling bark in winter. Birch trees are well known, providing dapple shade and butter yellow autumn leaves. Betula utilis, the Himalayan birch, is generally more delicate and often grown as a multi-stem or in a cluster, with gleaming white bark standing out against background greenery. Betula pendula, our native silver birch, also has a light branching structure with a stunning silhouette in winter. Crab apples need no introduction, offering spring blossom and red, orange or yellow fruits in autumn. Some varieties show grey autumn colour before the leaves fall and by choosing the rootstock you can control the ultimate size. Our native rowan or mountain ash, Sorbus orchiparia, will grow to a medium sized tree, again with creamy white flowers in spring good autumn leaves and berries. There are several varieties as well as some non-native forms that are usually smaller and can have yellow or white berries instead. An evergreen Mahonia adds architectural height to a border with bright yellow fragrant flowers from late autumn to February depending on the variety. Charity is the most widely grown. By contrast, Leicesteria is a shrub that I think should be much better known. It forms a clump of hollow stems rather than a woody framework, creating an elegant vase-like shape. It can be cut down to 30 centimetres in spring and reach two metres by the time it flowers in midsummer, followed by dark red berries. The purple smoke bush Cotinus is mainly grown for the leaves, but it will produce a haze of tiny pinkish flowers if left unpruned for a year, hence the name. However, cutting hard back in winter produces much larger leaves, which look dramatic when they turn red in autumn. Eliagnus is a constant blast of sunshine. 
all year round, but maybe not for you if you like subtle colour schemes. It is a great shrub for the back of a border though. And finally, Cotoneaster. It's a broad genus, including a few large arching shrubs like this one, Cotoneaster frigidus. Bees love the small pale pink flowers, and then you get autumn leaves and berries. Cotoneaster lacteus is a similar sh shape and size, but retains the leaves through winter, which makes a great foil for the red berries. Smaller evergreen shrubs always seem to give stability to a border, but don't have to be boring. You need a female variety of Skimia japonica to get these clusters of white flowers, followed by bright red berries, that are great for Christmas decorations, but seem to last all year long. The black Pittosporum tom thumb is possibly my favourite small shrub. It doesn't flower, but the new leaves emerge in spring as a pale mint green above the older darkest purple foliage, as you can see in the photograph. The dogwoods, Cornus alba, are probably best known for their winter stem colour, but you can extend the season of interest by choosing Siberian pearls, shown here with white berries and stunning autumn leaves, or the cream variegated Cornus alba elegantissima. OK, I know that formiums are not technically shrubs, but they are evergreen and structural, and so they fall into the same layer. They're offered in an increasing range of leaf colours, including striped and again, nearly black. Of course, there are huge numbers of herbaceous perennials that you can plant for flowers in the middle layer from late spring to the end of summer. Here, I'm highlighting a few that provide airy height, meaning that they grow up above their neighbours without blocking the view. Verbena bonariensis with its purple flowers is welcome all through the summer it has a very small footprint, occupying almost no space in the ground, rising up like a great candelabra, here growing amongst roses. Persicaria red dragon is much less known, but an equally good plant to rise above its neighbours. It's a bit sprawly on its own and really benefits from growing amongst other plants with its blood red leaves and stems and tiny white flowers. Another herb here, this is bronze fennel, and there's a green version as well. Uh, it rises up high, very fine feathery foliage, and it looks great growing amongst grasses such as this steeper gigantia, the giant, giant oat grass, which forms a mound of almost evergreen leaves low down, and these big flower heads standing proud, turning straw yellow in the late summer. Begonias are a robust evergreen perennial, providing great ground cover, leaves the size of dinner plates if they're happy, and useful spring colour with flowers of white or pink rising above. Don't forget herbs as well, for a, useful for a sunny border as ground cover, not just for the cooking area. Purple sage and golden oregano, again you'll get leaves all through the winter if it's not too bad weather. Another evergreen perennial here, Eucara, seemingly coming in an increasingly wide range of colours from the bright lime green down to almost black, providing a mound of leaves all through the winter, again, as long as it isn't too severe. Low growing grasses as well, this sort of fountain shaped carex, technically not a grass, it's a sedge, uh, but coming under the same category. This one's called Evergold, and thin strappy leaves that form a great foil to taller plants all year round. And ferns, this one's the Japanese painted fern, suitable for fairly dry conditions, most of them like shade. There are a whole range of ferns suitable for more damp soil too, if that's what you have. But they don't flower, of course, uh, but great contrast in foliage. And so we look at bulbs, like these tall, statuesque, strong growing blue camassia, great for growing through ground cover and really benefiting from having the leaves obscured as they begin to fade and get quite messy. This is the cyclamen heterofolium, the ivy leaved cyclamen, great leaf markings uh, coming in white or pink flowers, pink possibly more common, very small, so they need an open space when they flower in the autumn, but by, by the following spring they've pretty much disappeared, and so a summer growing plant can grow over the top and fill the space. Ornamental onion, the alliums, these are interplanted. Um, amongst peonies which are going to come up and flower afterwards and again great for spreading over and hiding the allium foliage after those big purple flower heads go over. 
and snowdrops. Nobody needs an introduction to snowdrops, but worth putting out there just because they're such a welcome plant in early spring, really the end of winter, um, giving us all hope that summer's around the corner just again. Roses are great for adding height and flower power. If you want to clothe an obelisk or trellis, then use a climber that will reach two and a half to three metres with strong, stiff stems. For a wall or up a tree, then rambas are more vigorous, like this rose of Banksii that covers two storeys and two walls supported on wires. There are plenty of clematis to choose from too. This clematis serosa flowers in winter on typical thin twining stems. Clematis montana comes next, spring flowering and another vigorous grower. This one contrasts with the blue flowers of Ceanothus and goes up into the conifer behind. But you could grow it through a summer flowering shrub to get two different seasons of flowers in the same space. And here we have a large summer flowering clematis covering a fence panel. But they're also useful to grow over a spring flowering shrub like an evergreen rhododendron effectively giving a second flush of flowers. And finally, another cotoneaster. This one is the fishbone cotoneaster horizontalis. Not growing at all horizontally, but starting out on the other side of the fence and here hanging over the top. Tiny white flowers in summer beloved by bees are followed by a brilliant autumn display. With tiny red leaves almost indistinguishable from the berries. Well, here we are then, at the end of the year round garden, with just time to loop back and recap the principal themes that will help you to develop your garden with more confidence and less frustration. In this final video, you have seen a selection of plants that offer colour and texture in different ways at each season of the year and have considered how they can be planted together. Use every part of the plant Choose plants of different height and shape and spread plant interests throughout the seasons. Part two explains how thinking of your planting plan in layers from ground cover to head height helps achieve a natural flow of plant interest from one month to the next. Use the vertical space, create ebb and flow and start with the permanent structure such as trees and shrubs. And right at the start, in part one, you saw the key principles of a great garden for all seasons and how they apply to your own garden. Identify where layout and landscaping help or hinder. Use a wide variety of plant types to provide interest in all seasons. And start with the areas you use most frequently all year round. I really hope that you enjoy making the most of your garden all year round and I would love to hear about how you get on. There's more information about how the Gardening by Design box of tricks can help you to plan, plant and look after your plot on the Gardening by Design website. I hope to see you again on another topic soon. Happy gardening! <laughs>